it, since I was with you last year, I don't know if you noticed, but some weird stuff has happened in the past year. Uh, it, it has, I've joked, I'm glad that God hasn't taken me up on this joke, but I've, I've joked about it a little bit in the fact that if I had known three plus years ago when God was finalizing in my heart that I was to plant a church here back in Southwest Florida, I, um, if I had known that a worldwide pandemic was going to come, I probably would have balked, right? I would have said, no way, you're crazy. Uh, it's hard enough to pastor, it's hard enough to keep a church going, uh, and then you throw a pandemic in there, and, and yet you, you want me to plant a church in the midst of this whole crazy thing. Because planting a church uh, in the culture that we're in now, there is no other way to do it other than the hard way. Like, Maybe there's some places still in the country, you know, some lush, you know, Bible Belt suburb of northern Atlanta or something like that, where you can hang out a sign on a Sunday morning and 75 to 100 people are just going to automatically come. But it doesn't work that way in southwest Florida, uh, much like it doesn't work that way in the northeast of the United States. Uh, people just aren't naturally bent to go to a church, and uh, they're not bent to try something new, especially. So... The hard work of this thing, and this is why I appreciate your three-year commitment in this, is that it's a, it's an ongoing deal. Like you, th this isn't like a one-year shot where you just get a church up and going. I mean, it's like a six, seven, eight-year process now because you have to build relationships one-on-one -on -one with people. You have to network within your community. You have to develop even um, professional partnerships with local businesses and. To, to get to know the movers and shakers in your community, the community leaders, and uh, trying to gather people and gather ministry leaders who want to be a, who are mission minded, want to be a part of what you want to do. Um, it's it's tough stuff, and every piece of that puzzle involves all the things that COVID has sort of shut down. Right, like to meet people personally and shake hands and speak to them face to face was gone completely there for a while wasn't it i mean like we were you were chastised if if you even shook somebody's hand or uh lord forbid you gave somebody a hug i mean how evil you were um so and that's the kind of church that we were sort of trying to be I mean, we wanted to be a church that grew slowly, we grew intentionally, we grew out of a, a basis of discipleship and one-on-one -on -one relationship building, um, and all those pieces were sort of taken away. And then uh, we had begun meeting last year when I was with you all, we were meeting on the campus of the State College of Florida, SCF campus in Venice. It was lovely, it was nice. They made it available to us on Sunday mornings for a, a nice, nice, hefty price. And uh, they were really proud of their campus. The, the downside is the moment COVID hit, they said, we don't want any outside groups coming on our campus anymore, so we won't be available to you. So we went into like weird reboot mode where um, we met outside for a couple months every other week in a, a pavilion and our people sweated through the word of God every Sunday morning. And, um, and then just in the past month uh, or so, uh, space has opened up for us in Venice and we were able to rent our first permanent space that's ours 24-7. You know, it's not, it is good news. Um, it's, it's not uh, the Ritz. Um, it's, uh, it's just a nice place where we can, a transitional space where we can begin to relaunch and regrow and, and you know, share the word of God and fellowship with one another. So, um, that has been that has been pretty exciting but it takes the help and ministry of you all to do that and i'm going to i'm going to share a little bit uh, throughout the message today um, how your ministry to us has been beneficial even during the times of covid so philippians 4 is where we're going to be today and i want to share with you uh paul's words to the church at philippi very special church to him uh, and he talks a little bit about how special they are to him with regard to the partnership in ministry. Philippians 4, verses 10 to 20. Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. 
You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it is kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied. Having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to share with you four values that I see in this partnership. And my prayer is that it's not just uh, a giving relationship, but that you receive, as Paul talked about, as a part of this partnership as well. The first value in this partnership is this. Partners understand the ongoing work of missions and that it's hard. A partner like you all understand that the work we're doing in missions is hard. After Paul started the church in Philippi, he, he left Macedonia to continue the work of spreading the gospel and starting churches. We know this because even in the letters to, um, to Timothy and Titus, the pastoral epistles, he's encouraging them in how to start churches. All the nuts and bolts that are required of from appointing pastors to, uh, you know, teaching and leading the next generation. So he goes and Paul leaves Philippi, this very special church that he started, um, and he left Macedonia, and he's spreading the gospel, starting these churches. And one of the things that we know from reading the Acts, uh, the account in Acts, and from reading his letters, is that at times it was incredibly overwhelming to him. Almost defeating, almost to the point where he wanted to give up. But he couldn't, because according to him, and this is these are his words and not mine, um, I must preach the gospel, is what he said. It was lonely for him at times. We know that he, he spent time on the road, we know that he spent time in prison cells without anyone else. So what he had to do was to call upon the recollection of those people who had poured themselves into him and had given him. This is why the church of Philippi was just incredibly precious to him. We know that the work was defeating at times. It, what brought Paul joy, and we read this in Philippians, and we just read it, it wasn't simply finances. It was the fact that they were sharing, I love this phrase, sharing in his trouble. They were sharing in his trouble. Gang, when I came in here this morning, several of you just came up and immediately you remembered me, you shook my hand, some of you said, you know, to heck with COVID, and you, you hugged me. And I so appreciate that. Because it tells me that I'm not just a distant <laughs> ministry that you fund. But that I'm a person that you believe in. So important am I that you remember me by name. And I get it. I'm in Sarasota. I'm in Venice. The stuff that I'm doing isn't entirely practical to the way... Your lives are scheduled and some of the things that you're doing. I understand, but you haven't forgotten me. And you understand the work that I'm doing and how difficult it is. You, you share in me and you share in my trouble. The word for trouble here is a Greek word, philipsis. It means hardship. The flippy church was full of people who had brought, they had brought to Paul not simply their purses, 
but they brought their hearts to him as well. Gang, I, I beseech you, I'm so thankful to have $1,000 to put towards our church work. But nothing would mean more to me than to know that some of you put me on your regular prayer list and that your heart becomes one with mine and that you share in our affliction, not just financially, but that you share in our affliction personally. Um, the, the Southern Baptists have been amazing this year to my family. Uh, not just individual partnerships like this one, which is amazing, but your pastor was just talking about the cooperative missions that you participate in. Do you know that when our congregation stopped meeting because of COVID, Southern Baptists sent my family, not just the church, sent my family. And this, this has never happened before. I planted now two churches. This has never happened before. Sent my family a check for $1,000. No, no, it gets better. The week, a week after that, the Florida Baptist Convention sent my family a check for $1,000. And then three months later, Southern Baptist sent my check, family a check again for $500. And all of it because they know that there's so much that's being juggled on the plate of a church planter. The last thing they wanted to feel was that they were alone right now. That their burdens were being shared by however many million Southern Baptists we have across the country. You're part of that in a very real and practical way. Like for us, when you work really hard, you know, this is an example of a hardship, if I can just be transparent. I was telling your pastor this morning, when you work really hard to put a children's ministry together for the first time, and God brings like four or five little ones, you know, and as a church plant, you get super excited no church wants to be full of just, you know, no offense, but no church wants to be full of just bifocals and gray hair like you want as a man who wears progressive lenses. You, you, want, you want young people in your church, don't you? I mean, you want to know that you're developing the next generation of followers of Jesus. And the, the, the prime age to reach people for Christ is that like 5 to 18. That's, that's the prime age to reach for Jesus. So when, when you have young people in your church, you're just like, hallelujah. So a family comes and you get excited and you, you love on them and you, you pour into their children and then COVID comes and they leave and you find out they left because... They felt like there was another church that offered more for their children than your church offered for children. It's crushing, isn't it? We don't like to talk about it because we're super spiritual people who trust in God. But I'll tell you, especially as a pastor, it's like a dagger to your heart. And when they call you and you have that conversation, as a pastor, you have a responsibility to encourage and be loving. And in the whole time, you can just feel a dagger twisting in your because I've seen the ladies in the church, and in particular my wife, pour into children's lessons throughout the week in between her regular work and try and put together the best little crafts and things, the videos that are going to help them to remember the lesson that week. And during COVID, my wife took goodie bags to the little ones at their home and dropped them at the front door so that they could continue to learn about Jesus while they were away from church. When you get that kind of news, it makes for a long Sunday afternoon that turns into a long week that can turn into a long month. It's nice to know that you have partners who will always appreciate your heart and appreciate your labors. Here's the second thing that Paul talks about here. Partners don't shy away from the ongoing investment in missions. They, they understand that to see the gospel go forward in the world, it takes an investment 
an investment in missionaries, an investment in church planters. It's crazy to think that Paul's mission to the world was funded by one church. And you think to yourself, is that true? Yeah. Uh, and a new church to boot. That's where you guys fit in so perfectly into this equation. Paul started the church at, remember how Philippi, uh, the church in Philippi got started. Paul uh, went into the synagogues and nobody wanted to hear anything about this Jesus. So then Paul went down to a place of prayer where some women were meeting by the riverside. That's where he, he shared Christ and some women got saved by the riverside. And it says they went home and their households got saved. And then the church in Philippi just started that way. And they fell in love with Paul, and they fell in love with the mission, and they began to fund and fund and fund. That was the church that funded pretty much all of Paul's New Testament mission work. And yet they continued to allow Paul the freedom and security needed to be about God's business. He said in Thessalonica, when he was in Thessalonica, he said, this is another phrase that's important in Scripture to remember in in, the, in Philippians chapter 4, he said, when I was in Thessalonica, you gave once and again. So when your pastor says, we've committed for three years, that's no joke. Like that's incredibly meaningful and significant that this isn't just something that is a once and done deal and we can feel better about ourselves and, and you know, get this guy out and on his way. This is a, an ongoing commitment. When I was in Venice and hard times came, and you'll be able to say one day, yeah, we gave once and again and again. Second Corinthians 11, Paul writes this in verses 8 and 9. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you, he tells the Corinthian church. <laughs> uh, he was not happy with them at the time. And he wanted them to know that there were other churches that were making his ministry to them possible. He says, And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. He wanted them to know that there were churches who got it. There was a church who understood. The church of Macedonia, that's the church of Philippi, they came and gave so that Paul wouldn't have to burden the people that he was trying to minister to. That's you. That's you. It allowed him to not confuse the gospel message with the need for money and resources. The last thing I want the people of Venice to think, the people who are lost that we're trying to reach as a new church, I don't want them to think that we exist to get into their wallet. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus came to save and that it's a gift. It's free. The gospel is free. So you and your maturity and your heart are making that possible. That's the value of partnership. It keeps me from having to sweat how much money do people give who come to our church, and I can focus more on how can I reach them for Jesus and how can we raise them up in maturity in the faith. Someday they'll give. I believe that if we teach the scriptures correctly. The third aspect of partnership that's so significant. Partners in mission know that you can't outgive God, right? I tell my children this all the time. They get so sick of hearing it. The Lord, this is out of the Psalms, the Lord is the owner of the cattle on 10,000 hills. How could you possibly outgive the guy who owns all the cattle? We can't relate to that now because we're not an agrarian society anymore. But the guy who owns all the cattle owns everything. And I love Paul's reminder here that he's not the only one benefiting from their giving. He's not the only one that's benefiting from their giving. The church at, at Corinth is benefiting from their, from their giving. He says the church at Thessalonica is benefiting 
from their giving. He's benefiting from their giving. But he's not seeking the money from them. This is a great phrase as well that you need to highlight or focus on. It says, I'm not seeking the money, but rather the fruit. And then he says this, that increases to your credit. Isn't that cool? Like someday, someday, this church is going to stand before the Lord, right? And they're going to, you all are going to give an account, just like I'm going to give an account, and my church is going to give an account. And one of the things that's going to stand to your credit is your support of the mission work where I'm at in the southern part of the county. You think, oh, that's not that significant. Here's how it's significant. Uh, COVID scared me to death as a church planter. When it first started coming on, you know, I, I could care less. If, if I get sick and the Lord takes me home, that, that's his business. I, I'm okay with that. I'm, I, the Lord and I are cool. I made that deal with Jesus when I was 13, right? Like, you died for me. I have nothing to offer you. That's a pretty sweet deal. Uh, and I know that I'm a screw-up. So if you can help me overcome my screw-ups, and you can still love me the way I am, and give me eternal life, I want that. And God was good with that. So if something happens to me because of COVID, or I get sick, or... Lord, help me, I walk out here and get hit by a scat bus. I'm cool. <laughs> but, but, there were a whole new set of challenges that I was unsure of and how to overcome. I could not outthink this one. I was not creative enough to overcome a worldwide pandemic. And I had no idea what to do. So the only thing I could come up with is look for people who are hurting and try and find ways to love them practically. That's all I could come up with. And a lot of times, honestly, it was financial because that's what people were dealing with primarily. Other than sickness, people were losing jobs, weren't they? They, they didn't know where their future was going to take them. So because of your giving, we were able to do some things in our community that um, blew people away. We were saving on rent because, you know, that was taken away. Uh, so we um, decided to just say, you know what, we're going to take some of our budget, we're going to take some of our rent money, and we're just going to start blessing people. And we have a lady in our church that's an executive administrative assistant for the president at um, Venice Hospital. And they had just got done furloughing like a whole bunch of their uh, maintenance and cafeteria staff. And these people just got notices one day. And guess what? Within a few days of that, our church showed up with $2,000 in grocery cards. And everybody in our church hand wrote cards to each person who received a grocery card telling them that we love them and that uh, better days are ahead, and that Jesus loves them. And then, I got word from one of the principals of the local elementary school as they were beginning to ramp up their preparations that um, she was scared that um, art class wouldn't be able to happen. Because typically, the only way they can make art class happen is if children share supplies. Well, I, I mean, the last thing I want is like a six-year-old, you know, doing this, and then handing my kid a tube of paint or glue, or even better, you know, the kindergartner who licks the glue and then hands it to your kid. Like, it's just not the right day and time to be doing those kinds of things. She said, 